We're thankful for all of you that are here tonight. And we join together in one accord, with one, uh, one mind and one spirit. We trust with one judgment. We join. We're glad that those of you on the live team have joined with us too. Tonight, I'm going to be ministering on being rooted and grounded in love. <clears throat> My text is taken from Ephesians 3. I'm going to read verses 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts, that, in order that, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, that's a very large statement, and... Uh, I like large statements. I like thinking, particularly when it's in the courts of the Lord. Amen. Now, in the world, love is not generally associated with growth and productivity. The word itself has been reduced to a self-gratifying love, a self-gratifying act like making love. But in the divine economy, which is where we've been planted in Christ, God put us in Christ. It's 1 Corinthians 1.30. God put us in the body of Christ. It's 1 Corinthians 12.18. We're pleased him. We've been joined to the Lord so that we're one spirit. It's 1 Corinthians 6.17. And in this environment... This love we're talking about takes place in this environment. Amen. You can't emulate it. In this environment, love involves like expression as compared to just feeling. It involves participation. You're, you're joined with somebody. It involves comprehension. It involves advancement. And a whole lot more. So if a person says, I love God, I love Christ, I'll be perfectly upfront with this. We expect them to express it in life and in word. I have nothing, I have no, I do not countenance quiet, unspeaking disciples. That's not what Jesus called us to. We expect ob objectivity. That is, the love has a focus. Yes. It is a focus to it. We expect their lives to be focused, Amen. That's right. centralized. We expect them to be involved in divine, holy experiences. Receiving from God, expressing from God. Actually, the, the term love itself finds its definition in God. You take God out of the consideration, you, you have a hard time defining love. If you go to a, like an American English dictionary and define love, you, know, you, you, won't be, you won't be pleased with what you read. It isn't that it's bad. It's just as you sense it. There's got to be more to this than, than that. And we're talking again about being rooted and grounded in love. So I want to take a moment here and deal with what, like, what are we talking about when we say rooted and grounded? What, what are we talking about? <clears throat> there are two different pictures here. Rooting has to do with like a, like a tree and fruitfulness. Grounding has to do with like a building or a dwelling place. Colossians 2 7 uses the term rooted and built up in him. <laughs> it's kind of the same. Yeah. Rooted and built up in him. 
and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And he adds, beware now, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. You're just talking about it, philosophizing about it, telling you what they think or what they surmise. Beware of that. And vain deceit, and it's something that does, it's not productive. There are, there are ideas that aren't productive. They're just ideas, that's all they are. After the tradition of men, see, some people have a traditional view of love. It may or may not be true, but you can't embrace it because this is what we believe. <laughs> that's not good enough. This is what our particular group or family or however, this is what we felt for all along that love it. This is not good enough. Love has got to be living. It has to be living. And after the rudiments of the world, rudiments of ABCs, love can't be shallow. It can't be frothy. It can't be on the top of things. It's got to have depth and substance to it. People don't lay down their life for a toy. A lot of what parades itself as, as love is really shallow. Yeah, we we'll talk about, about being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted a tree yeah. that doesn't blown over easy. Yeah, right. It may bend over with the weight of the wind, but it stays rooted in the ground. Yes. And it bears fruit upward. Yeah. Amen. Two or three times in Scripture it says bear root downward, fruit upward. There's not much fruit upward unless there's root downward. You can't really teach people to be fruit bearers. Bearing fruit is a result. So you teach people, you work with people, you get set examples before people in order to, to root them so they can bear fruit upward. Rooting and grounding Grounding has to do, as I say, with the building, and in this case, it'd be a foundation. Rooted, something living that produces fruit. Grounding, something that's stable, intended for somebody to live in it yeah. and activate themselves in it. Colossians 1.23 speaks about a condition on, under which a person is, will be accepted into glory. If ye continue in the faith... Grounded and settled. Grounded and settled. Not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature under heaven, whereof I, Paul, have made a minister. The gospel cannot become an obsolete message. Now I was raised with this idea that the gospel is preached to the sinner and everybody else is taught. Now that isn't in the Bible. Let's be quite clear about this. I mean, the gospel is preached to sinners, but it's preached to the church too. And no church, I want to be dogmatic about this. No person, no group of persons, no church, no movement that does not emphasize the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is stable. I don't care what they do. Doesn't make any difference what they do. Because the gospel not only gets you out, it promotes growth and stability. All of the seeds necessary for you to grow in Christ are within the gospel of Christ. It is not a power. It is the power of God unto salvation. Not initial, not initial salvation, but salvation all, that's going to be culminated at the resurrection from the dead. All the way. Yes. Amen. And as soon as a person steps away from the gospel, under the delusion that we all know that already, they enter into the realm of jeopardy yes. and powerlessness. That's right. There isn't any power into salvation anywhere else. Yes. 
God has deposited in Christ, and the exclusive message of Christ is the gospel. Rooted. See, conversion is essential, but it's not a conclusion. Conversion is the commencement of a process. We are being, we are being saved. Now, God announced to us his project and purpose in salvation in Romans 8, 29, and 30. It's not a popular passage of scripture because there's a word in there that people are afraid to say. Yes. Predestinate. Now, I use, I told you this before, but when I was preaching in a lot of different churches in the, our four-state area, I would tell the people, I'd preach on predestination. I'd tell the people, this is a Bible word now. Let's all say it together. <laughs> Nobody would say it. Oh, you don't believe this. Just try it. Trying a group of people, say, let's all repeat this together. It's a Bible word. Predestinate. They won't say it. It scares them, see, because of some things that's been attached to it. But God, here's what God said. Whom he did foreknow, he's accounting for salvation. Now, whom he did foreknow, that doesn't mean prescience. It isn't that God looked ahead and saw what you'd do. You're not the one that drove salvation, but if that prescience idea is true, you would be the one that drove it. Whom he foreknow, known unto God are all his works from the beginning. He also did predestinate. To be conformed mm -hmm. to the image of his son. Yes. That's what God. So if you're conversion, it's the commencement of that project. Yeah, conformed to the image yeah. of his son. Uh -huh. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Mm. Yeah. Like he's an elder brother. Yes. Yeah. Moreover, moreover, yeah. moreover. Whom he did predestinate, then he also called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you've heard it explained this way, and it, I think it's a good comparison, although it's, it is a human idea that there's a general call that does go out to everybody. Whosoever will may come, let the spirit and the bride say come. They, that's not to be sounded with discretion. That's uh -huh, yes. to every creature. But then there's another, there's this call here. Now, if you've been around chickens a lot, where they have a, a lot of little chickens, you go out in the chicken yard, you see these several hens have had cl clusters of little chicks, and they'll be fiddling around, wandering over the yard. But if there's some danger, some animal comes around, thunderstorm comes around, this mama hen who's been clucking all along, she's been clucking all along, she clucks a different cluck. Yeah. And all those little chicks run to her. Yeah. This call here we're talking about. Yes. This is a special call. Amen. Sometimes he's got to send somebody like Paul over to Philippi to a group of women uh -huh. by the river to issue that special cluck. Yeah. And, they, and they came. That's right. Sometimes it'll be a, like a prison keeper. In bed with his family. And uh, he said a special. It was you. There come a time here in Christ. There came a time when God sent you a minister. Amen. As the first Corinthians 3, 5 says. Who are Paul? Who are Paul? They are ministers by whom you believe. To whom God, whom God has given to every man. They, yes. they come to. Whom he predestinated. Then he also called. Yes. And whom he called. Then he also justify see there's no <laughs> he doesn't say they can be or they ought to be or what. we're up high now we're up high now but this has a lot to do with my message so I'm talking about being rooted and grounded in love and I'm going to define what kind of love we're talking about here he justified severing them from the penalty of sin and from a sinful nature and whom he justified, he also glorified, and that's going to happen at the resurrection of the dead. 
That's God's purpose. That's, he says that's what God's doing. God knows them that are his. You know, he told Timothy, he said, now, it's a second Timothy 2. In every house there's, I mean, there's garbage cans and there's cooking vessels. Yes. Or vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Now he says, you know, Timothy, you got to purge yourself from these bad vessels. And he that cleanses himself from these bad vessels, there'll be meat for the master's there'll be meat for the master's use. God will use them. They'll be suitable for divine employment. Now from one point of view, the, your objective as a person, as a person, your objective is to be suitable for divine use. Amen. He's already told you there's, you're going to have to be very careful about selecting who you're going to be around all the time. Who's going to influence you. You've got to work this out. I, I can't work yours out. i got my own work cut out doing this. And you can't work it out for somebody else. But it does have to be worked out. This is because God has a program. He starts out with you being alienated, but it's going to end up with you being glorified. Now, in this process, there's a, there's a continual change that takes place. Whom he foreknew, he predestinated, that, he, that this is what God's doing. This isn't what God, like, just wants to do. This is what God is doing. He's conforming people to the image of his son. So when you look at him, you think about Christ. When angels look at him, they think about Christ, Jesus now, there's a change that takes place, and it can't be done just by human initiative. There's some things that you've got to do, and there's exhortation for this and everything. And we don't deny that, and it's got to be done. We've got to provoke one another to love and good works and teach sound doctrine and these sort of things. But in God's program now, there's a change agent yes, that's, right. that's in charge of the change. And God moves this agent who's the Holy Spirit into yes. because ye are sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying Abba Father now he's the captain of this change process but you've got to look you've got to look at the one he represents who is Christ the only way you can look at him is to look at the message concerning Christ which Paul says is the record God has given, John says is the record God has given of his son. First John 5, you've got to consider, listen, if you want to be changed, you don't study a manual on right conduct. Yeah, amen. This isn't it. You don't teach people what they ought to do, not if you want them to change. Yeah. Now, God's program changed. That's God's program is conforming people to the image of his son. So it's a, that's God's program is change, not trying to change, not suggesting a change. The change is going to take place that God intends. Amen. Amen. So this Holy Spirit, he comes in. And we all with open face, that means you don't have a veil over your face. There's nothing overshadowing how you think. See, there's some systems of thought that like cloud the mind. It's like it's like hanging it's like hanging something over your face you can't see through. There's some systems of thought. The world of pleasure and entertainment. It's like it's like a shroud. There's all there's religious shrouds like this. But he the Holy Spirit, that's how he works now. There can't be anything between you and Christ. There can't be some other priority. It can't exist. Not your family, not, not anybody, not, not your own will. Can't be anything. You with open face, that means unveiled face. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. The glass is the gospel. The imagery kind of breaks down. You're not looking at your image in the glass. <laughs> God doesn't tell you to look at your image. 
you're looking at Christ, but as it reflects back, that image changes you as it re Amen. reflects back. So that's why 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all, yes, we all that are in Christ, with open face beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory, which at one stage of glory, to glory, to an increased stage of glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Spirit's actually doing the changing, but he does it as your mind is caught up with Christ, who he is, what he's done, where he is, what he's doing, what he's going to do. Your mind is dominated by this thought so that whatever else you may think about, it filters through this consideration of Christ. Now, this changes what you do, changes what you say, changes where you go. You can't change people by citing some rules. I mean, who hasn't tried it? There's parents that have raised their children absolutely right, and their, their children turned out to be garbage cans, broke their parents' hearts, godly people. See, because a change is wrought by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit does it as a person is captivated by Christ Jesus. Then we're changed into the, into the same image. This is how the means now is going to root and ground you by this means. We enter into a greater, in other words, as we change, we enter into a greater affinity with God. We're able to blend with God in the thoughts and purposes. Now, all of a sudden, God's purpose becomes our purpose. Yes. See, I shall be satisfied when I awake with his likeness. Where do you get that idea? See, that's, that's what God is, is doing. It enlarges your understanding, rooting and grounding. I'm defining what rooting and grounding is. Rooting and grounding doesn't mean they don't do sin. They don't sin anymore, or even though that that is true, they don't live in sin anymore. But that's not what rooting and grounding means. Rooting and grounding doesn't consist of what you don't do. It consists of what you do. And so here's what God is doing. He's He's making it so he can talk to you without lisping like a baby. Yeah, yes. See, some people, we hope they don't stay in the state, but some people you gotta you gotta lisp to them, mama, dad, dad. You gotta you can't talk right out plain with them. If you're Jesus, you have to talk in parables to them. That's why he talked in parables. It wasn't really to make truth plain. It's that the people didn't understand it and they weren't intended to understand it. That's what Jesus said. I, I talk to others in parables because it's not been given them to understand. In other words, God hasn't made arrangements to change people by baby talk. So you got people like Bible translators to try and simplify Scripture, and so they insert their ideas in Scripture, thinking that that'll make it a bit plainer. This isn't how change is wrought. Change isn't wrought by making it simple. Change is wrought by gazing at Christ. And you've got to make, and Christ, there's nothing simple about Christ. You can't talk simply about Christ. You don't know anything about his first 30 years except when he's in the temple at 12. So studying Christ's life as just a, a social, just a person, that, that won't do it. you gotta, you got to start studying him when he was 30. Yeah. See? That's what you're to gaze at. You're not to gaze at him when he is at Bethlehem. Yeah, that's right. That gaze won't change you. You can study the manger from now till Jesus comes. It won't change you. Amen. It's the glory of the Lord that changes you by the Holy Spirit. Your understanding begins to be enlarged, and as your understanding enlarges, you participate more. Even in the world, in, in uh, occupations that are, involve skill or craftsmanship of some sort, the more a person knows, the more they'll be used. Mm -hmm. yes. that, that's, how, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. So when a person comes in, if they're a beginner, they'll start at the bottom, 
maybe apprentice or something. They won't be, they'll just be given small things to do, but I mean, no one just wants to be like a lifetime apprentice. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, he wants to end up being productive. That's the same in the kingdom of God. God doesn't intend for people just to be a, a nursery people all the time. He intends for them to grow up. And what enables, what enables a person to do that? Rooting and grounding. Amen. That's necessary. If a person is going to grow up in Christ, which is what God intends to be done, if they're going to be changed into the same image which God intends to be done, they have got to be stable. They can't be wishy-washy. Uh -huh. They've got to be rooted like a tree, grounded like a solid building built upon a rock. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Now let's look at the context of this love. Rooted and grounded in love. What, what love are we talking about here? Well, we're not talking about our love. Not even our love for God. Here in his love, not that we love God, but we're talking about love, not that we love God. That's not what we're talking about. You got to do. You have to love God. That's the first commandment, mm -hmm. with the, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That you. So it's not that this isn't necessary, but this is not the love in which you're rooted and grounded. Yeah. Here in His love, First John four ten. Here in His love, this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, it won't take you long to learn those facts. It will not take you long that you could memorize it and quote it every day. But it'll take you a lifetime to understand what it involved for Jesus to humble himself, take on himself the form of a servant, lay down his life and take it up again so you could be changed. Takes a lifetime to learn that. That's the, that's the love you're rooted and grounded in. In other words, you've got to know that not scholastically or academically, you've got to know Christ died for you. You've got to know Christ purchased you. You've got to know that. And you can't know that just like learning ABCs. It's not like this is learned in the in the experience room of experience that as you trust in God more and more all of a sudden your understanding begins to flower out you, he, the, he that's in me is greater than he's in the world so you don't come in knowing that that can be, be kind of scary for a person to think that that's so if you do these things you'll never fall that's what Peter said That's rooting and grounded. Rooting and grounded is when God's boundless love is perceived by you and you connect the love of God with what's happened to you yeah. mm -hmm. and why you're different and why you think different and why you want different, mm -hmm. why you're not going to be satisfied till you're dwelling in the courts of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. See, some people aren't at that. They're not at that point yet. Mm -hmm. We don't condemn them. We were in that point. I when I was in that point. We are going to work to get them out of that to where they're more confident, where they have a boldness in the faith. And they're not shaken by the wind, not easily shaken, rooted and grounded in his love. Now, these, uh, the scriptures talk about this love. and It's uh, in the book of Ephesians that we're taking some of these texts from. It's quite amazing. Ephesians 1, 4 he hath chosen him, he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in, in love. Amen. Not in your love, in his love. Amen. Now we know that people whom God loves can end up irritating God. He gave you an example of Israel, just so you know. He said he set his love on them. That's what Moses said. God set his love on you. And then they provoked him so that he abhorred his own inheritance. See? But when you're rooted and grounded, that doesn't happen. So the objective, the objective for the person of God 
be rooted and grounded, is to know where he's at in Christ, to know what God has done, to be convinced that he that sent him is greater than he in the world, be convinced that God will not suffer his foot to be moved. He, he's convinced that God will work in him both the will and do of his own good pleasure. He's convinced of this, and so he stays in the house. He stays in the house. He's got a good foundation now, and the fruit starts to come now because he knows this. He's not doubtful now. I know that if this is most unfortunate, and it's not altogether the people's fault, but there are very few Christians who know who they are in Christ. And it's a tragic circumstance, but... If you know it, you should you should be an, an agent for the Lord. You have to be rooted and grounded now to help people to see where they're at. This 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 is a great, so great salvation. This is a so great salvation. There's not a the devil, not a demon in hell, there isn't anybody that can separate you from the law. Of, that's what it says. From the love of God. But see what he's saying, you've got to know this. You can't philosophize about God's loves in your prayers, in your ambitions. You have, there's a fellowship with Christ. God calls you into the fellowship of his dear son. And in that fellowship, you, you're you becoming aware yes. of what God thinks of you. And there are times when in your heart, he'll say, well, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. You did good. On that, yeah. he'll speak that to your heart. It won't make you proud. Yeah, that's right. You make you humble, as a matter of fact. Yeah, you'll you'll say, "Oh, it was not I, but the yeah. grace of God that was in me." You'll yeah. say, "You'll tell, you'll tell him yes. what it was." That's rooted and grounded. See where I'm coming from? That's what rooted and grounded in love means. That you're really clear about you and God. You may be a little fuzzy about you and the church, or you and other. Friends, you may be a little not, not quite sure about that association. You want to be, but you're not quite. Yeah. You know, friends like that. We've yeah. all got friends and acquaintances like this. We're just, we're not trying to condemn them. We're just not sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, anyone, if you're that kind of person that makes people not sure, I mean, at least live so they can be sure about yeah. Your, yeah, right. your condition. But you can't have that kind of question about you and God. You're rooted and grounded in his, in his love for you. You've seen it. You've seen it. And you're not willing to forfeit that for anything. No matter what the world offers you. You'll go through fire and water. You'll go through all kinds of suffering. You'll lay down your life for him if necessary. See, that's, the, that's what roots and ground you. You can't, you can't be rooted and grounded if you're unsure of the love of God. So here he defines it. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that ye should be holy and without blame before him in love. Can you, can you believe that God doesn't find something blame, blame you to be blamed for? Paul said, I want to present you blameless. And Paul said, you want to live in a harmlessly and blamelessly before the world. Can you believe that when you stand before God, he'll not find a fault in you? He says, you can die tonight absolutely perfect. Amen. That's right. you confess all your sins before you go to sleep. Yeah. Well, you know, confess them all. He'll cleanse you from them. You'll have to do the same thing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you have to do the same thing tomorrow. Yeah. But you want to maintain that state. And as you do, it roots you and grounds you. Yes. And pretty soon you're more, you're more bold. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon you speak under circumstances before you couldn't. Mm -hmm. You couldn't speak. Someone asked you a reason for the hope that's within you. And you can boldly, you can answer. What, what is that? That's a result of being rooted and grounded in love. Yes. You may not be sure whether that person likes you or loves you. You may not, you not, may not be sure about that, but you are sure about God Amen. and his love for you and his care for you. Amen. I'm persuaded, God. He's, I'm persuaded, Paul said. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. I'm persuaded of this. Yeah, nothing can do this. Are you persuaded of this? 
If you are, you're being rooted and grounded. Again, Ephesians 2, 4, he talks about this love again. This is the love now, you're rooted and grounded. Rooted and grounded in love. That we're defining what that love is. God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. That's the love in which you're rooted and grounded. And there's an exclusive message that announces this. And it is the gospel of Christ Jesus. The gospel announces this love. That's why the church has to hear the gospel. they got to hear this. Because this kind of understanding that God's for me and not against me, God loves me, this knowledge does not come easy. Particularly if you're living in an age where there's a lot of distractions and a lot of theological babble. But particularly if you're living in a time like this, this kind of understanding does not come easy. If you've got it, you know already it took you a while to get it. You already know this. You may have been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years, but only recently it's, it's dawned on you who you are in Christ Jesus. But that knowledge has made you rooted and grounded. Amen. That knowledge has made you stable. That's what, see, if, if you know God's for you, it doesn't make any difference if you're in a storm out there in the middle of the sea or you're standing before someone who has the authority to behead you or you're tied to a whipping post yeah. and going to be beaten. It doesn't, doesn't move you. You'll just, you'll just preach to your captors. Amen. I can remember when as a young man, I was confused about the lack of depth and what looked like a lot of hypocrisy that existed in the professing church. and It almost made me bitter. You know, I thought, no, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to read Fox's Book of Martyrs because I know that someone that laid down their life for Christ had to be serious. Yes, that's right. I want to read that. So I read it. And I read about the testimony of people. One man, he, the, the trial was, the way they determined whether a person was guilty or not, they chained him to a big rock and threw him in the water. And if he sunk... He was guilty, and if he floated, he was not. Well, this man thrown in, and lo and behold, he floated. And as he was on the top of the water, the rock bobbing up and down, he preaches to the preaches to the audience. And then Fox said, "This is." And as soon as he had finished his testimony, he forthwith sank. How could he do something like that? Polycarp. You got time to the stake. No. Oh, don't time me. I'll stand here. He that stood by me in life is going to stand by me in the stake. Yeah. How was he able to do that? He knew God loved him. Amen. They, he knew that God is for him. Uh -huh. He knew that anything that if he left the world, it was a matter of promotion, yeah. not demotion. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> he knew that. Now, you don't know what kind of experience you're going to face. Yes, right. Who knows what a day may bring forth? Right. We don't know. Uh -huh. But if you're grounded, rooted and grounded, whatever it brings forth, yes. you'll be able to stand. You'll be able to hold up under it. Amen. Rooted and ground up, ground in, and uh, grounded in him. <laughs> now, there's some things accomplished by when you're rooted and grounded. In the first place, God, first of all, Paul said he prayed that God would give them the Holy Spirit. Here's how I said it. That he would grant you, God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's the first thing. He's praying for the church, for people now. I'm, first thing I'm praying, I'm saying that God would make you strong through his Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. You're going to have to be strong now. So being uh, rooted and grounded is coupled now with strength, yeah, uh -huh. not just appearance. And why are you doing that, Paul? So, verse 17 of Ephesians 3, so that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. What? 
So Christ can dwell in my heart? I thought we asked Jesus into our heart. Well, let's see, that's what that. There's no example of someone in Scripture asking Jesus into their heart. Well, don't believe me. Just try and find it. <laughs> For Christ to dwell in your heart by faith, you got to be strong. Hmm. He just doesn't take up residence in everybody. There's a sense in which you're joined to the Lord, I understand. But see, being identified with Christ is the beginning. But that maintaining that status, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. Maintaining the status. So that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith that ye being rooted and grounded. See, so here for Christ to dwell in your heart, dwell in your heart by faith means he's there and you know it. But for that to happen, he's got to send the Holy, he had to send the Holy Spirit. He couldn't just like teach you that and give you a couple of lessons on that. that just send the Holy Spirit to do that. But Christ could dwell in your heart by faith and even that's not, that's not the end of the matter. That's, we're still not where we ought to be. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, so you may be able. See? Mm -hmm. so you're not going to, what we're going to say here now, you're not able to do it unless Christ is dwelling in your heart by faith. And Christ isn't going to dwell in your heart by faith unless God sends the Holy Spirit to strengthen you with might. Yes, amen. So that he can dwell in your heart by faith. So you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And so you can see and be impressed with the absolute magnitude of salvation. Amen. There are some views of salvation that are pretty small. Like you can quit smoking. I'm serious. There are people that's pretty much the extent. Or you quit drinking. That's pretty much the extent. But listen, salvation is a big matter. It has a height and breadth and length and breadth, height and depth and length and height. It's, it's, it's like the city four square. It's big, big, big. You're never going to want to go further with God if you don't see that there's something to be obtained. You can't just say, I want to grow up in Christ and it, there's no objective in it. You, you don't know really what that means. What does that mean? I mean, I don't sin a lot, or what, what does that mean? That means that God puts you to work in direct proportion to what you can comprehend. Yes, amen. Paul labored more abundantly than they, that was the other apostles, than they all. Why? He saw more. That's why he saw more. Yeah, amen. So if you've got an extensive work for the Lord to do, then you've got to see a lot. Of this great salvation. Amen. Now, people that have labored for the Lord in foreign soils, they, they've learned this by experience. When you go, you have to go armed with a legitimate knowledge. You can't just hand up a book and say it's all in here. You grounded and settled involves having some cognitive idea about how large salvation is. I'll give you a little example. All things are yours. Paul, he's yours. You say, Paul's hard to understand, someone says. Paul belongs to you. It's 1 Corinthians 3, 5. is what he said. All things are yours. Paul, he belongs to you. His writings belong to you. He's yours. Apollos, he's a great exhorter, man who could handle the word of God. He's yours. Peter, he's yours. Things present, things to come. The world, life, death. But that's, that's the scope of salvation. This is the scope of it. Yeah. How big it is that there's ever a person in the history of the world that was moved by God to write a revelation. It belongs to you. Yes, amen. Even if it's the book of the revelation. Right. It belongs to you. All of God's servants belong to you. You can take advantage. Life belongs to you. It's your advantage that it gives you a span of time where you can grow up into Christ. But if you don't know this, if somehow this has eluded you, you won't spend a lot of time. Grow rooted and 
grounded in him, able to comprehend with all saints. Are, are you able to comprehend? Would you say, I'm not asking for an answer here, but, but God is. Would you say that you're able to comprehend that if someone got up and talked about the deep things of God, you could really take them in? Well, I, I'm persuaded. Mm -hmm. Probably the majority of you are. Maybe. And you're there's a, all over the world. There's people like you could take the deep things of God and talk about them. They just oh, they they may never heard them before, but they're able to able to take them in. Now this uh, the scope of salvation it involves the entirety of your person, spirit. Reasoning from the inside out, spirit, soul, body. Your spirit, that's the essential you. Your soul, that's the expressive part of you. That's the part that can express. And your body, it's, it's earthen vessel, this clay pot that you got to make it serve you, but Salvation affects us all three. Spirit, Amen. who you are, who you are uh -huh. at the core of your person, who you are. What you love, yeah. what you prefer, what you hate. Your soul, how you express it. Expression in thought, expression in words, expression in deeds, expressive part through your members. Yeah. Romans 6 refers to your members or your expressive capacities, whether it's the hands or feet or inward capacities. And God strengthens that in the entirety of your person. So with your body, you can actually serve God. Amen. With your, right. It's marvelous. So in your thinking, you can serve God. In your thinking, in your preferences, you can serve God. You can say, you know in your heart, God's pleased with this. Yeah. Like he hears, he hears Job say, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Uh -huh. yes. God said, hey, did you listen to that, Gabriel? Did you hear that? That's right. Did you hear that? That pleases me. He's not willing to do anything to lead him away. Yes, Davis, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in tents of wickedness. Let me spend some time in God's house. That, that's very pleasing to God. That's an, that's an affection that's been touched yes. by God. Paul says to the Philippians, he said, now, now this salvation that you got, God put it in, you got to work it out. You have to work, work, work it out so it, so it can be visibilized, so, so to speak. Work out your own salvation now in fear and trembling. But I want, now, as you do this, there's something you got to know. Remember, you're rooted and grounded. You got to know this, that it's God that's working in you, both yes. the will and do of his own good pleasure. See, that's, that's part, that's the root ground, rooted and grounded part. Yes. Work out your own salvation, fear and, fear and trembling, that's an obligation. But see, until you see this and it makes sense to you, it's God. It's not I, it's the grace of God that dwells in me, Paul said. When you see this, that's being rooted and grounded. And you've got to believe it is. If you, if you see it, you, it comprehend it. It doesn't confuse you when you hear this. It doesn't confuse you. You still may have a few questions about how you're rooted and grounded. You may look, look at yourself as a baby. You're not a baby. Yeah. Not if you see this. Yes, you've been advancing. Yes, the Holy Spirit's been changing you. Uh -huh. And the perimeter of your understanding, it's getting bigger. Yeah. Uh -huh. Rooted and grounded. Then he continues that Ephesians 3 text, Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that ye being rooted in love, rooted and grounded in love, might be able to comprehend with all saints what is the height and length and depth and breadth, and to know the love of Christ, uh, which passes knowledge. So you can know something that's unknowable. <laughs> I tell that until you want in your heart to know something that's unknowable. You won't get very far. But salvation includes this. You can know the love of Christ that cannot be known on an academic level. Yes. It can't. Uh -huh. It's not that kind of love. Right. It's an experiential love. Yeah. 
Jesus said one time, Now he that has my commandments and keepeth them, that, that's the one that loves me now, that's the one that loves me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and, and I will love him. I will love him. Now, that's not the first time he loved the person, but it's a, it's a deeper. Mm -hmm. I will love him. Remember he chose those disciples, 12 disciples. He had a lot of, lot of disciples. The other of them he chose 12. Yeah, uh -huh. yes. And of the 12, he chose three. Mm -hmm. And of the three, he chose one. Right. And each of these, they got more. The three got more than the other nine. Uh -huh. yeah. And the disciple whom Jesus loved, he got more than the other three, yeah. the, other, the other two. That's right. See? I will love him. Yes. John, why is it John is noted as the disciple of Jesus loved? It apparently was because his love was so pure and unfiltered and unhindered. He was even at the cross, you know. Yes. None of the others were there. He was just stuck with the Lord all the time. He's the first one to recognize the Lord on the show. It's the Lord! Yes. It's the Lord! Yes. It, he was rooted and grounded uh -huh. for those times comparatively. Uh -huh. And then uh, Jesus on the night of his betrayal, he says to his disciples in John 15, 9, I'm talking about the love now you're rooted and grounded in. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. I, I've loved you. All through my ministry, I loved you disciples. That's why you were able to be with me. That's why everywhere else I went, you went too. I loved you. I have loved you. Uh, continue in my love. How do you continue in Christ's love? How do you do it? By preferring him. Yes. When there's a competing interest that rises, you say, no thanks. If there's something that demands your attention, that pulls you away from Christ, you just say, no. That's a temptation. No. Yes. As ungodliness and worldly lusts. I prefer Christ. If you prefer him, you're continuing in his love. Mm -hmm. And if you're in his love, he's manifesting himself to you. He's showing you things, enlarging your understanding. But even that's not the end of the matter. Rooted and grounded in love. So you can comprehend with all saints what is the height and length and depth and breadth. So you can know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge. Now here's the bottom line. That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Boy. Yes. <laughs> that you. Yes. Now God that can't get all of him in you. You're too little. Yeah. But the part of you that can be filled can be filled with him. Amen. Amen. Right. You remember that occasion when a, a widow woman come to the prophet Elisha and said, well, I got this dilemma got this debt, I can't pay this debt off, and the man's going to take my sons. Can, can you help us out with this? <laughs> hey, look, there's no counseling group that could help you with something like that. He said, well, tell you what, he said, uh, what, what do you have in your house? Well, I said, I got a, I got a pot of oil. Oh, that, we, we can use that. We can use that. That see, you got a pot of oil too. Yeah. You're in Christ. You got a pot yeah. of oil. Yeah. And I said, "What well, I want you to go to your neighbors and get as many vessels as you can, all sizes, you know, small ones, big ones. Fill up your house, wall-to-wall -wall bottles. And when you got the house full, don't don't start doing this until you got something to put it in. Uh -huh. <laughs> Shut the door. Uh -huh. This is a private thing." and start pouring. Yeah. She took that bottle of oil and she filled up the first jar and looked like none, yeah. looked like the nothing had been poured out. Yeah. Wait a second. She filled every one of those bottles, yes. every single one of them uh -huh. were filled with the fullness of that bottle. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and the bottle didn't, nothing went down in the bottle. Or now God's like the master bottle. Amen. You're like one of those vessels. Yeah. Uh -huh. You may be a small one, you may be a big one. Uh -huh. 
But you're a vessel. The main thing is to be a vessel that's in the house. Amen. Got to be a vessel that's in the house. Amen. Being filled with the fullness of God. Is God taking, filling you up? So what's in you what is God. The, the essential thing about your character is it's godly. Fill you up. But for that to happen, <laughs> you've got to be able to know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge. That's, that's got to have that. And you're going to have that. You've, you've got to be able to comprehend the, the marvelous scope of salvation. And to be able to do that, you've got to have the Holy Spirit make you strong. Amen. See? This is all what's involved in being rooted and grounded. Yeah, that's, just, that's what we're talking about here, being rooted and grounded. Today there's a religious form being promoted that neither expects nor enjoys being filled with the fullness of God. So that uh, filled with the fullness of God means you think like God. It, it's, it's only limited by your capacity. Paul, he, was, he had a great work to do, but he understood what he was preaching about. He didn't read books about what to say. He is filled with the fullness of God. See? Yes. So how much of God uh, are you familiar with? What part of God is like a tool you can put in your hand and you can use it? You've got you've got some. You've got you got to kind of think about these things, but you'll be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, let's say it like James would say it. The G might be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's it. It's the same thing. That's the same thing. We may be harmless and blameless, the sons of God in a wicked generation. That's that's what he's talking about. Now you see, that's why. Uh, That's why we spend a lot of time together. Sometimes people think we're weird. Some people think we're a cult, you know, and all this kind of stuff. You can't let that bother you, what people think about you. You can't, can't let that bother you. I'm, I'm too p busy getting filled. I've got time for these, these infantile assessments. Now, it's filling. We're in ground in love involves being filled. But see, all the fullness of God dwells in Christ bodily. That's Romans uh, Colossians 1.19. In him shall all fullness dwells. So now, you've, now you've got the entire Godhead involved in your life. Amen. You've got God. He set the objective and everything. The Holy Spirit, he is in to strengthen you. And then all the resources are embodied in Christ. So you've got the whole, <laughs> the whole Godhead's involved in your salvation. How can it fall short? Amen. And then he says... Uh, 2 Peter 1 and 4, and I'm going to talk about being filled with the fullness of God. I'm going to just say it a little different way. He says, that God's glory and virtue yeah. have given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, <coughs> by these promises, right. not the commandments. Uh -huh. It doesn't say he's given us many commandments that by the... He's given us exceeding great and precious promises, <laughs> which is what God is going to do and that promises to you, mm -hmm. to your children. You might be partake that through these promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Yeah. That's the fullness. Uh -huh. Amen. <laughs> so what does it boil down to? Knowing God and God's love, which is the thing you're rooted and grounded in, mm -hmm. involves being acquainted with what God has said He's going to do in Christ. Yeah. You've got it's got to kind of materialize in your thinking that way. Here's what God said he was going to do. They shall be mine. Mm -hmm. When I make up my jewels, they shall be mine. Yes. They shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. I will write my laws in their hearts and put them in their minds. I will not remember their sins anymore. You'll remember your sins. Yet sometimes it'll almost aggravate you that you do. But there's a reason behind it. 
God doesn't want you ever to forget Amen. that he forgave you. Yes. Doesn't want you ever to forget that. He forgave you all trespasses. Yes. Amen. So, Brother Annette, uh, that's a little bit of what's involved. To the degree that you perceive and experience the love of God, to that degree you're rooted and grounded. Whatever that degree is, that's the degree to which you're rooted and grounded. To the degree that you abide in his love, that, that, to that degree you're rooted and grounded. And to the degree that you're rooted and grounded, you can comprehend the scope. Not the fullness of it, but you'll a lot more than you thought you could. Yeah. You'll comprehend the scope of salvation, and you'll be able to know in your heart yeah. what Jesus meant when he says, I will love him. Boy, that is a big statement. I will love him. Yes, amen. And my Father and I will come in. Make our manifest, and my Father will love him too. Yes. See, that's, Amen. that's the love, brethren, that you rooted and grounded in. And I commit you to uh, to the Lord, who can make you stand, who can keep you from falling, and present you faultless before His throne. And I can guarantee this: if you will not forget that. It'll change the way you live. Amen. 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 Brother Robert, you have our...